Okay, welcome back to another week of CS125. So this week, and a little bit of next, we're going to devote to wrapping up our discussion of Java's object model and type system. So today, we're gonna finish our discussion of polymorphism and do a little bit of review. We'll also look at some of the other tools that Java provides for building class hierarchies, for determining how, how uh, various parts of structure within the object tree. We'll also this week talk about interfaces. So that's a new topic for us this semester, but it's something that's in inc incredibly important, actually, and a really powerful way that Java provides um, that's a more flexible form of inheritance in a way. All right, so we'll talk about that. And then next week, we're gonna talk about exceptions, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about object references, which is a topic um, that's important to understand how to work with the data structures that we'll be starting to talk about for the rest of the class. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a couple of the problems from last week's quiz. The scores on the quiz were quite good, so I was happy with that. Um, but a couple of multiple choice problems threw people off a little bit, so this was one of them. Um, it's a question about constructor overloading. So here's an example of my dog class. It provides three constructors. One takes no arguments, the second takes a string, then the third takes a double. And the call, the, the, the cho one of the choices here, there was actually no choice that provided a double. I don't know if anybody remembers this question. What was the, the correct answer here? Provided what argument? Yeah. An int, right. And, and we'll see this in action today. So when possible, Java will cast the arguments to any function to try to match one of the available function signatures. So in this case, it says you're calling the constructor with an int, there's no match, there's no constructor here that takes an int as an argument, but I know that I can safely cast an int to a double without losing any information, so I'm gonna do that, and then I'll be able to match the third constructor. Again, we'll come back and talk about this later, because Java will do the same thing with object uh, arguments as well. And that's one of the ways that we get the power of polymorphism. That's one of the reasons that, that we use it. Okay, second question. So here I have the same dog object, I have the same three constructors, one takes no arguments, doesn't initialize either of the fields, the second one initializes the name, the string, or sorry, the breed, and the third one initializes the weight. How would I, if, let's say I wanted to set both the breed and the weight, how would I do that here? There's no constructor that does both of that for me, so how do I accomplish it? Yeah. Well, do I need a separate method to set the breed here? Yeah. Yeah, so neither breed or weight is marked private here. And so I can set either one of them directly. So either, there's a couple ways to do this. I can actually use any of the constructors that I have. I can use the empty constructor and I can set both manually, and or I can use either one of the other constructors and then set the other field. What I can't do is I can't call the constructor twice. So that was one of the things that this question was designed to get at. I can only call a constructor once. Once I have an object, I can't, an instance of a class, I can't then call another constructor. Internally, the constructor can call another constructor using super. But once I have an instance of a class, that's been constructed, there's no way to call another one of its constructors. If I wanna change its variables or its fields, I have to do that using the setters or getters that it provides, or if those fields are not private, I can set them directly, as in this case. All right, questions about either one of these? Questions? Good, okay. So let's go over one of the, the programming problems quickly. Um, so again, people did quite well on these, I was happy about that. So there was a question about creating a public class called points. 
This was something to sort of design to, to hold a score. So it's got two public methods. One of them adds to the score, that's called score. The other one subtracts from the score, that's called penalty. Both of them take a single integer argument that determines how much I'm going to adjust the score by, either positive or negative, positive in the case of score, negative in the case of penalty, and it should return the new score after the modification has been applied. So in a way, these are sort of like setters and getters. They're not quite setters and getters because so the classic setter and getter pattern uh, either sets the variable or gets the variable and just returns the current value. It doesn't modify it in this way, but this is sort of a, an altered form. All right? And then we gave you an example of how this was supposed to look. We also pointed out, and you've seen this language a couple places on our homework problems, that um, you should not allow modifications to the internal state of your object. And so this is a hint, essentially, that you need to make sure that the internal state, the score that the points object is maintaining is marked as private. The only way somebody should be able to change it is by using the methods that you provide. All right, so let's, let's do this one. I'm gonna create a public class called points. Whenever we do class modeling, you know, there, one of the things that you wanna think about and again, this is unfortunately not something that we can give you a lot of practice at in this course, because usually what we're doing is we're asking you to build something to a specification. So whether it's on the homework problems, whether it's on the MPs, we're giving you a specification that we're asking you to construct an implementation. We're not asking you to construct the specification itself. But this is something to think about, because as you go on, you know, when you do your own projects using Java as an independent developer or working for somebody, you get to make these choices. There's no pre-existing test suite. There's no documentation that we created for you. Um, you're on your own you to decide how to do this. So what's the internal state that this class needs to maintain? Well, you know, we always wanna think about two things. One is, what are the methods it needs to provide? Usually we're gonna tell you what the methods are because we need to know what they're called and what their signatures are in order to test your class. But frequently, the private state of the object is up to you. You're finding this out on MP3. All right, so what, what is the state that this class needs, each instance of this class needs to store what piece of information? Sometimes the answer to this question is it needs to store several things, but in this case, what does each point's object have to hold? What's its internal state? Yeah. The score. The score, yeah. So I need to, the score to store how many points have been scored. So I'm gonna create a, and I'm marking this as private because the question told you to make sure that nobody could change this without the class's permission. So no one should just be able to modify the score during the game. They have to use your methods. All right, so I'm gonna store the score. I need to provide a constructor for the points object so that this type of example works. What are the arguments to the constructor? So it looks like my constructor takes a single int argument. What am I supposed to do with that? You guys are low energy today. Is it because it's warm outside? Yeah. Yeah, I have a sing I need to provide at least one constructor. I could provide more, but this example requires a constructor that takes a single int argument, and I'm gonna use that to set the score, the initial score. All right, and now I've got my two methods. And these methods really provide what we sometimes refer to and what we'll talk about later this week as the public interface to the class two instances of this type of object. So again, if you think to MP3, what we've provided in the documentation is how we're going to use your object. We haven't told you what you need to do internally in order to get those methods to work. That's up to you. But in this case, we told you that you need to provide two methods. The first one, they both Taken, they both return an int, so the first one we called score. I'm gonna, and the second one 
was called penalty. All right. Both of them take a single inter integer argument. So what is the score function supposed to do with the past argument? Someone who hasn't contributed yet today. Yeah. Yeah. Score says you scored some points, so I'm gonna update my score internally to reflect that, and then I'm supposed to return the current score. Same thing with penalty. So, except penalty is gonna remove points from my score. So I'm gonna do a decrement, and then I'm gonna return the current score. That's it. So if I run this now, this should work. Yep. Looks good. Questions about this? So just as a little bit of review, what's gonna change here if I do this? Will this example still work? Is there anything gonna change about the example that I just showed? No. But what's gonna change? Right, so at this point, every instance of my points object will be sharing the score. And if I create 10 of them and start making modifications to all of them concurrently, then I'm not gonna get the results that I want, right? So for example, you can see this easily. Let's create a second points object right here. And let's initialize that one to 10. And so now, everything's wrong. Why? Because when the second constructor runs on line 18, it changes the value of points that all of the instances of the point object are sharing to be 10. And then all of the calculations for the first point object are incorrect. If I take the static keyword off here, then things are gonna work the way I expect. Okay, good. Any questions about this before we go? All right. So what I'm gonna do today is actually spend most of the lecture talking about some of the same things we talked about on Friday. Um, it's not because I don't have other things that we're gonna talk about this semester. We have plenty of stuff. It's because this, these topics are important. They're also sort of subtle. This is one of the first places where we're starting to see some interesting conceptual material. This is less mechanical. This has more to do with design and so some of the reasons behind why Java supports polymorphism can be hard to understand at first. And so today, we'll go back, we'll talk a little bit about what polymorphism is, and then we'll talk a little bit about why. What is it for? What does it allow me to do? And what are some of the trade-offs involved? So you remember in Java, every class has a single parent. In some ways, this is a limitation to Java's type system. It's also something that we'll come back and talk about when we talk about interfaces, because interfaces allow us to implement a kind of inheritance that isn't limited by this tree-based structure. So in Java, there's no way to have a class inherit from multiple parents. I have to pick one. Because I picked one, that organizes all the classes in Java into a tree with object at the top. So everything in Java inherits from object. As you remember, if you don't explicitly extend another class, then you are implicitly extending object. Okay, just said that. So object provides a small number of methods that are shared by every object in Java. So every object in Java can either override these methods or it receives the implementation of these methods from the object class. So we talked about what these are. One of them allows me to print an object to the console. This is useful for debugging. A second one allows me to compare any two objects to see if they are the same. And the third one allows me to retrieve a small representation, unique representation of that object. It's called a hash code. Again, we'll come back and talk about why that's useful in a month or so. So all objects in Java provide at least these methods. 
And like I mentioned, there's maybe like half a dozen more of these that aren't interesting for our purposes. So every Java object provides these. Even if I create an empty object that just inherits, sorry, even if I create an empty class that just inherits from object, it still receives these methods. As I go down the tree, what descendants do is they typically add methods. Remember, there's no way to remove methods in Java. I can't say I don't want to implement equals. Either you implement equals, in which case you can do it your way, or you receive somebody else's implementation, your parents' implementation, your parents' parents' implementation, or if you go all the way up to the top, you get the object default implementation of equals. So there's no choice. You either override it and provide your own way of doing it that's appropriate to your class, or you get somebody else's implementation. But there's no way to say, I don't want that. I don't want you to be able to call equals on. I can call equals on any object in Java. Doesn't matter whether you provide an implementation for it or not. As I go down the tree, what happens is that, you know, descendants of object typically provide their own methods. And then their descendants provide more methods. And their descendants provide more methods. So as you go down the tree, what happens is the methods that I can call increase. The number of methods increase. You know, a specific implementation of something usually provides some of its own behavior. And so this is a trade-off we'll come back to, where as you go up, in the Java tree, there's fewer things that I can do, but I can do them to more classes. So again, I can call toString on anything in Java, but there's a small number of methods for which that's true. As I go down the tree, I pick up more and more behaviors that are appropriate to the particular class that I'm talking about. But I can't call those methods on as many objects, because I can only call the methods on all of the classes that inherit from that class. Okay, so there's this trade-off here um, involved in polymorphism. I go up, fewer methods, fewer behaviors, more objects that I can call them. As I go down, more methods, more behaviors, specific to whatever I'm doing with my program, but fewer objects that I can call them. So like I said, typically what I want to do is I want to override some of these default methods. And I can do this with methods that I inherit from object, I can also do this for methods that I inherit from any of my ancestors. I'm always allowed to provide my own implementation of that method if I want. And when Java tries to resolve this, it'll start with my class. It'll say, do you provide a method that matches the type signature? If the answer is yes, it gets used. If the answer is no, it looks in my parent. And it keeps doing this until either it finds a method that matches, at which point it stops and uses that, or it gets all the way to object, and if object provides it, I'm good. If object doesn't, then the method call fails. All right, good. So this was our example, and again, this is not a particularly interesting example to start with, but one thing I'll point out, like I just said, is that even an empty class will still provide a certain small set of methods. So I can call toString on this empty class. I have this silly class hierarchy I've created. It's very linear. And none of these classes has provided toString, but I can still use it. I can also use equals. So we can replace this with equals. I'll try equals with null. And that returns false. So again, nobody has provided this equals method for me. It's provided by object. Just for completeness, let's look at the last one that object provides, which is hash code. Okay. What is that? Probably the memory address of this, this object. Again, it's not something that I provide. Okay, so let's, let's see how this works in action, and, and let's use, um, let's use equals. So equals, the type signature of equals is that it returns a Boolean, and it takes an object to compare with. That's the type signature of the equals method. So equals returns whether or not the two objects are equal, and what I pass it is another object to compare against. I can provide an extremely simple implementation of equals that returns true. 
it's not necessarily that useful. Hold on a sec. But let's try it. Let's call it with null. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, sorry, I need to give it a name. Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah. So now I'm not using the default implementation of equals anymore. So, so you can imagine, so let's, let's see here. Let's do this. Let's return false here. So even with this simple example, what you can imagine here is that these subclasses of dog may provide their own definitions of equality. So for example, my sweet old dog might have an int called sweetness level, determines how sweet the dog is. And it might say that two dogs are equal if and he, well, I need to do some more complicated things. I'm not gonna do this example. This, this is not a good one. We'll come back to this. Let's see here, let's, so let's do this. Let's say, let's define some custom methods here. Say return whoop. Let's get rid of this guy. And then let string speak. Sweet old dog doesn't bark as loud. That must be all caps. Yeah, it's an old dog. All right, so here's an example of objects overriding a method to modify how it behaves. So I'm, I've added a new public method to my dog class. And maybe this is something that belongs on pet, but that would depend on how you designed your methods. Not every pet makes a noise. Um, but dogs bark loudly. My old dogs bark a little bit less loudly, and the sweet old dogs bark quietly. And so now the idea is how is the type resolution going to work? So let's create a a sweet old dog, and let's have that dog speak. So how did Java resolve this method? It said, okay, I'm looking for a method called speak. It takes no arguments. I start in my sweet old dog class. I look to see if there's a method there. The method does exist, and so that's the one I use. If instead I created a reference, if I created an old dog object here, ah, sorry. Now I start at the old dog's speak method. If I remove this method, what's going to happen? What do you guys think? Now I get the all caps version. Why? Because I started looking for that method in old dog. Old dog didn't provide it. So Java said, let me look in the parent. The parent does provide it, and so I'm good. So now let's do the following. Now let's get rid of this. What's gonna happen is that I'm not going to be able to call this method. So, now let's create a method here, and let's call this public um, static void um, speak, and let's have it take a dog. Okay. Now, instead of calling it directly, I'm gonna call my method. I'm gonna pass it shoot you. So th is this going to work? 
What's gonna happen if I try to run this code? So what have I done? I've just made a small change here. I've created a static method on my example class that takes an object of type dog and tries to call a speak method on that. Is that going to work, given this class hierarchy? So one way to think about this is based on this class design, am I sure that every object that is either a dog or a descendant of dog provides a speak method? No, I can't be sure, why not? Where do I need to provide it for this to work? On the dog class, right? So I can either provide a speak method on the dog class, which I had before. So if I try to run this now, let's make sure it doesn't work. Yep. Oh. Let's do this. Oh. Ah, sorry. Let's just call this. Right, so now I'm getting a compiler error, and the compiler error is when I try to call speak on the dog class, because it doesn't provide that. So there's two ways to fix this problem. One way is to change the signature of this to take a sweet old dog. At that point, so again, remember, if we go down the hierarchy, typically we pick up new behaviors. The idea is whoever designed this animal hierarchy didn't provide a speak method for all dogs, and only provided a speak method for sweet old dogs. Apparently that's something that they only learn to do once they get old and sweet. So I can either change my method to take less, fewer types. So now I can't call this method on a dog, and I can't call it on an old dog. I can only call it on sweet old dog. So now what will happen is when I try to, to call it, it's not going to work. What I would have to do here is I would have to say, let's turn Choo Choo back into a sweet old dog. Now it works. So that's one way to fix this. One way to fix this is if the behavior really is inappropriate for all instances of dog, then I have to change my method to only accept fewer types of dog. If I created a, let's create a, Example just keeps getting dumber and dumber. <coughs> Let's create another class called really sweet old dog that is saying sweet old dog. Now, if I change Tutu into a really sweet old dog, I'm not sure he's really at that stage yet, but will this work? Let's try it. It does. The reason this works is because really sweet old dog inherits from sweet old dog, which provides the speak method. And so all of sweet old dog's methods, uh, descendants, can be passed to this method. Questions about this before we go on? It's really important to understand. This is not the last example of it that we'll do. Okay. So what we've been experimenting with is this idea of polymorphism, right? So Choo Choo that I create on line 15 is not a sweet old dog. He's a really sweet old dog. But when I pass Choo Choo to the speak function that I've defined in my example class, it takes a sweet old dog. So what happens is during this function call, my really sweet old dog instance behaves like a sweet old dog. And the reason that it can do this is because it descends from sweet old dog. So I can replace a class with any of its descendants, and this function should still work. And the reason is that all of those descendants inherit any of the behaviors that I provided for that class. They may change how they work. So again, I can override my 
speak function here, and I can have it do something else. And so this is interesting. It's not, when, when the speak function runs on my example class, it takes a, a sweet old dog as an argument. I'm passing in a really sweet old dog, and it, that call will work because it's a descendant, but it's still not behaving like a sweet old dog. It's behaving like a really sweet old dog. So it doesn't lose its inherent nature, but it can be substituted um, for the sweet old dog. So again, we'll come back and talk about interfaces later in the week. Right? But this is an instance of what we call in Java subtype polymorphism. So every object in Java, like we said, except for the object object, is actually an instance of at least two types, itself and object. And so it can be passed, even an object that does not explicitly extend any other class, can be passed as an argument to any function that takes its type as an argument, or to any function that takes object as an argument. The reason for this is that Java will upcast things automatically for you. Okay, we've just, we've just been seeing this, right? So if I go back here, what happens when I pass the really sweet old dog choo-choo to the method that takes a sweet old dog as a parameter, is an example of the kind of casting that Java will do in order to make this work. So what Java will say is, is there a method here that takes a really sweet old dog called speak? And the answer is no. So just like we did when we converted an integer to a double, what Java will do is it'll say, okay, really sweet old dog extends sweet old dog, so I'm gonna start going up the tree. I'm gonna upcast it to a sweet old dog. Is there a method here that takes a sweet old dog as a parameter called speak, and there is. That's the one that gets used. So this is an example of casting in order to get, um, to, to find a method that fits the type signature, All right? But as we pointed out here, the instance is still a really sweet old dog. So when I call the speak method, I still get the method that I overrode on my really sweet old dog class. Just because I've cast it to a sweet old dog doesn't mean that I lose the custom behaviors. This is, this is what I want, all right? I can also downcast things. This isn't as common because it's hard to get right. I'm not gonna talk about it a lot today. We talked about that on Friday, right? So again, I want to bring you back to this, this idea, right, the Liskov substitutability principle which is named after Barbara Liskoff, Turing Award winner. Let me make this more concrete. So this definition is a little bit abstract. So let me rewrite it with some of the classes that we've been using. Basically this says, if dog is a subtype of pet, then any pet object can be replaced with objects of type dog without losing any of the desirable features of pet. So using the example that we were just doing, any really, any sweet old dog can be replaced with an instance of a really sweet old dog without losing the behaviors that I need. I need there to be a speak method. So either instances inherit that speak method from their parent in that case, or they provide their own. But there's no way for them to get rid of it. Okay. So, so and this is what allows us, you know, to use these common object methods. So this is not the first time that we've seen polymorphism in this class. We've seen, we've seen it in another place. Same names, different behavior. Does anyone remember? Or is anyone capable of just peeking at the next slide? Where did we see this in the past? We saw this before we talked about objects. Yeah. Yeah. Remember these types of things? I've got two functions called sum that take different arguments. So again, same names, different behavior. So this is actually another form of polymorphism that Java provides. So the same function is behaving differently depending on how many arguments it has. And I actually could have this function do something totally different if I wanted to. It'd be a little weird 
if I called sum with two integers and it added them, and if I called sum with two doubles and it multiplied them, that would probably be confusing, uh, but I could do that. So we've seen now two examples of polymorphism. Today we talked again about subtype polymorphism. So this is this idea that a single method can act on all the descendants of a given class because I know that they all either inherit that method from that parent class, that ancestor class, or they have to override it if they want to provide it in a different way. And then method overloading is another instance of polymorphism. So a method can behave differently depending on the number of arguments that I provide. Obviously, methods be always behave differently depending on the content of their arguments. The value that I get back from sum changes depending on what the parameters that I pass are, but I can also have different sum implementations that work differently depending on what the types of arguments you provide and the number. We will come back later in the class and talk about generic types as well. This is another example of polymorphism in Java. So I understand that this has a funny name, right? Polymorphism. It's like this, like, oh, you know, suddenly it feels like we're in biology class or something like that, right? Um, that's the feel like computer science. But understanding what this is for really gets at the heart of what Java's type system is all about. Okay, so I, I don't want you to gloss over this, and there'll be plenty of questions about it on next, on next week's quiz. You know, what it allows me to do is it, it still allows descendant classes to behave differently from their parents. I can override two string. I'm not stuck with objects implementation of two string. I can modify it if I want, and in many cases, that's the right thing to do. But I still, re sorry, but I still retain this desirable property of my ancestor, which is that I have to provide a two-string method. So now I can call print on any object in Java, and it will work. It will produce a string. So I retain that control over how my classes work, but I still get this generality, right? Anything can be printed in Java. And so the idea is that I can now write methods that work across large numbers of classes. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about interfaces, because the, the method signature, the type that I receive as part of my, one of my arguments, guarantees that certain methods are going to work. It guarantees that I can call certain methods on that object. So if I write a function that takes an a, a instance of type object, I can call to string. If I write a function that takes an instance of type really sweet dog, I can call speak. And I actually don't care what type you actually passed me. My method that takes an object rarely gets instances of type object. It usually gets descendants of object, but I don't have to care about that. I just call to string and everything works, right? Determining what the right type is for an argument, for a method, sorry, brings us to one of these trade-offs. And so this is something that we will talk a lot about for the rest of the class, because particularly once we start to talk about algorithms and data structures, um, it, you know, life is just about trade-offs. We're gonna talk about a lot of algorithms in this class for doing some of the same things. In all those cases, the reason why we provide you with a couple of options, the reason why as a computer scientist you need to know that there are a couple of options is because there are trade-offs. One is a little bit faster in certain cases, the other a little bit faster in other cases, maybe one uses more memory, that uses less memory, whatever. So this is a design trade-off that we encounter when we start thinking about how polymorphism works. So essentially, think about choosing the argument for a function. I have a function that I wanna write, and it's gonna take an, some type of object as an argument. The higher I go in Java's type system, if my method could somehow work with only taking an object of type object, then I can call it on any Java object, regardless of what its type actually is. So the higher I choose my type on the object hierarchy, the more objects that I can use. It's more general. But I lose those features that are provided as I go down the tree. So for example, if I write a function that takes an object as an argument, I can't call speak, that function that I wrote on the really sweet dog class, because not every Java object is gonna provide speak. I can only call toString equals and hash code. 
Now it turns out that actually I can write lots of pretty useful stuff just using those default Java object methods. That's kind of why they're there. Hash code, for example. So we'll talk later about a way to provide a really useful data structure in Java just using the hash code method. Now I can implement that data structure for any Java object. And it can store and can manipulate any Java object, because all it depends on is the ability to call hash code. And I can call hash code on anything, right? So I can do stuff with those default, those, you know, six or ten or whatever they are, default Java object methods. As I move my argument type down the tree, what happens is I can only, now only descendants of that object can be accepted by my method. But I get more power. I get more capabilities. So I can assume that the object provides more methods because I'm lower on the, the hierarchy. So again, as I go up the Java hierarchy, I lose methods, but I gain generality. There's more and more classes that can now be, be provided as an argument to this method. As I go down, I pick up all of those capabilities that are being provided, but I lose generality. There's fewer and fewer classes that I can, I can have be called. Okay, so we've done a fair amount with this example already, so I'm not gonna to go back and, and beat it uh, beat it like a dead horse, right? Like a dead animal. Um, but in this case, so for example, you can see my animal class that's the parent of pets and everything else provides this function called animal info. Now every descendant of animal provides animal info. My pet class provides something called pet info. Now every descendant of pet has a function called pet info. So if I needed to call that function called pet info, I can't accept an animal as an argument, because not every animal is going to provide that function. If all I need is to call this animal info function, now I can potentially write a method that works for all animals, regardless of whether it's a pet or something else. Okay. Questions about this before we go on? Yeah, Jeremy. So the question is, what is upcasting? So let's go back and look at our. Where was my? Right. So upcasting is casting an object to one of its ancestors. So what happens here is Choo Choo, that I've created on line 19, is an object of type really sweet old dog. Hope we all agree on that. That's the type to the left side, and that's the argument to new. When I call example.speak, example.speak takes a sweet old dog. It doesn't take a really sweet old dog. So technically, the argument that I'm providing does not match the type signature of this function. What Java does automatically is it'll say, okay, but I can automatically and safely, because of polymorphism, because of the Liskov substitution principle, I can automatically convert that really sweet old dog to a sweet old dog. That's an upcast. Once it's a sweet old dog, now I have a match for that function. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I will, Java will automatically cast objects to their parents or ancestors in order to try to find a match for a function. Good question. So by the way, just so you understand how this works in practice, system out that printlin that you guys have been using over and over this semester, when you call it on an object, it takes an object as an argument. It doesn't take a string, it doesn't take a pet, it doesn't take whatever. So every time you've been calling that function, it's been doing an upcast. Every time you call it with a string argument, it upcasts that string to an object and then calls to string. So that's been happening behind the scenes you know, throughout the class. Okay, I want to quickly talk about a couple of other class design features. Now these, you know, again, I think it's appropriate to talk about these in three minutes since these are not things that we're really going to expect you to use in the class, but they're interesting features of Java's class hierarchy. So final, so I can market classes final. What does that mean? Sounds 
you know, I mean, it sort of sounds like what it means. If my market class is final, I cannot extend it. Nobody can extend it. So essentially, marketing a class is final means that it's now the, it's, it's going to be a leaf on the tree. There's no way to extend that class. So here in this example, I've marked my dog class as final, and this attempt to extend big dog, to extend dog into big dog won't work. And you can see this on the example on the next slide. Okay, so I can mark a class to indicate that it cannot be extended. Now there's a corollary to that. I can also, and this is actually much more interesting, I can also mark a class to indicate that it can only be extended. Okay, so I can mark a class and say, nobody can extend this class, and then I can mark a class using this keyword called abstract to indicate that that class can't actually be created. It can only be used to, as a, uh, as a parent for other classes. So here what I've done is I've marked pet as abstract. Part of the idea here is that this allows me to provide shared behaviors across all pet instances without having to allow you to create a pet. Because if you created a pet, I'm like, what kind of pet is it? You know, you gotta tell me. So by marketing it as abstract, what that means is that I can extend it, so dog can extend pet, but I can't create an instance of pet. And this is extremely useful, because there's a lot of cases where like I said, I have shared behavior and state that I want to allow a bunch of other classes to extend, but a lot of times that parent class doesn't really make sense to create on its own. So here again, what you'll see, cannot instantiate abstract pet. Because pet is marked as abstract, I can't create instances of it. Now I can create instances of things that inherit from it, and it can do the normal stuff that we've talked about, like it can provide you know, behaviors and things like this, right? So marking a class as abstract means that it's available for extension, but cannot be itself created. So again, I've got these two interesting keywords. So this last bit, I will talk about briefly here, and then we'll come back. I think we're gonna do like a spooky Java lecture on October 31st in honor of Halloween, where we'll talk about some scary Java things, and uh, this sort of falls into that category. Um, so in Java, I can't mark a class as private, because that would make no sense. So essentially, in order to create a class, I have to use it, I have to create it. To create one, I have to call the constructor, but if I can't call its methods because it's private, I can't ever create a class. So I can't mark classes as private. It's not allowed. What I can do, to achieve roughly the same thing, just to sort of blow your mind a little bit at the end of class, is that I can create classes inside other classes. This is sometimes known as an inner class, and there's multiple different varieties of this. So here what I'm doing is that my class dog is public. It's created an inner class called dog food. That class behaves very much the same way as all the other Java classes we've created, except for the fact that it can't be used outside of the dog class. Okay, so we will come back and, I don't think I'm gonna talk very much more about inner classes, but we'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about spooky Java stuff. So, as a reminder, the early deadline for MB3 is today at five. Please uh, get, your, get to 40 points. I'm gonna hold office hours today from 10 to 12 in my office. Um, a reminder, we do not have class on Wednesday, here. I may record a video lecture. If not, um, we won't have any new material for you. I will see you all on Friday. Have a great week.